Welcome to Scary Saturdays with Kyle. We are hopping into today's episode, which is about the 1972 film Grave of the Vampire. This film is most famous, I guess, for being the first episode of Elvira's movie Macabre. Uh, it follows... It's not called Tomb of the Vampire? No, no. I think there is a Tomb of the Vampire, and maybe we'll get to that one day. But right, right now, this vampire has got a grave, and he's not happy about it. It <laughs> follows, uh, follows a woman who is basically uh, attacked, bitten, slightly turned... And raped by a vampire named Caleb Croft, played by Michael Pataki, who is also uh, Ivan Drago's trainer and manager in Rocky IV. Um, Caleb Croft impregnates her during this time period, and basically her baby is born and only likes the taste of blood. We follow that baby as it grows up into an adult and then vows revenge on Caleb Croft, the vampire. This is a... 40 year spanning horror film which is wow. very weird because the first 35 minutes is its own t self contained story and then all those side characters get pushed out of the way because we jump to the adult version of James the uh, the offspring of these two uh, played by William Smith William Smith also played Conan the Barbarian's dad in the original film uh, and got his first start in acting actually in the 40s he was in the ghost of Frankenstein as the young boy so he's kind of been moving his way through many decades of making films. Um, there's not a lot of other like famous people outside of Pataki and him in the film. It was directed by John Hayes, who was an adult film director as well as a horror director. Made a lot of schlocky films, and this one is definitely one of them. This is a movie where the poster sells you a movie that you're not exactly getting. Um, oh! <laughs> you know? It's rental bait. It's an incredible poster okay. for the 1970s one that would have easily sold this film to me, and, and it kind of did based on the, pic the picture. I find the ambition of the film incredibly engaging. It's kind of similar to a Hammer film called Curse of the Werewolf, directed by Terrence Fisher and starring Oliver Reed, in which we actually follow the lifespan of Reed's character from a child to an adult uh, and kind of interject as he's becoming the werewolf. This is kind of the same version of that, but as a vampire several years later and ultimately unsuccessful in that because we never really have a character to cling to. You know, we have James, but he's not really in the first 40 minutes of the film. And then he comes in as a full-grown adult. It's a little odd that we've had a 40-year time jump, and William Smith does not look like he's <laughs> Four, under eight. 40 at all <laughs> at that point. Um, he's going to night school, learning from a professor he finds out is actually Caleb Croft. And so we get kind of two separate films. And one thing that is good about that is that it kind of doesn't bog down the film in spending too much time with all these different elements. We get to kind of okay. feel the flavor and the narrative as it goes through. I think there are elements of it that are incredibly well shot. At the same time, there are also m moments of it that are just washed out with this heavy light filter, which you can't see a lot of the film about. Uh, the film actually entered public domain pretty quickly after being made, and that's okay. one of the reasons why it was in Elvira's movie Macabre, was they didn't have a budget to pay for these movies. So getting a chance to do something in the public domain um, was the choice. In fact, I watched this film on Amazon Prime and then I went down into my basement and realized I have the damn movie. Um, <laughs> I've owned it for over 10 years and I never got around to watching it. So now i got to watch my version of it because the Amazon Prime version is more cleaned up but still kind okay. of messy. Um, yeah, it was released as Seed of Terror as well in some places. Um, but what's most interesting about the background of this film is that it is based on a novel called The Still Life. And the screenplay and novel were written by the same person, and it's a name that you may recognize, David Chase. David Chase went on to create the show The Sopranos and write and direct ah. a number of episodes, ah. as well as doing the prequel film The Many Saints of Newark. Uh, this is a very peculiar thing. I tried to find the book, actually, when I knew I was covering the film. I tried to look up a copy of it. It's a very hard film book to find. The movie is in public domain. The book is barely in any domain. Uh, so if you get a chance to check it out, or if you get a chance and you don't want a copy, send it my way. I'd love to read and critique this book. <laughs> but uh, David Chase's screenplay is weird because when he wrote Sopranos, he had this element of he understood he, he understood how characters talk and how characters interact. And this film has some of the clunkiest dialogue. <laughs> and so it's very obvious to me that maybe his screenplay might have been usurped. Because John Hayes's other films feel a lot more like this film in terms of its dialogue and not something like David Chase would have written. Um, the film was only made for 50 grand and it was shot in 11 days. You can see that on the, on the film. Uh, and it was released during a time when you had, I think, multiple other vampire films that have been probably of more note. We had films like Blackula in 1972, The Blood Splatter, Splattered Bride 
we had Night Stalker in 72, and we also had The Vampire Circus. So there was a lot of vampire films out during that year, and this one probably got swept under with that. There's inherent cheese. There's inherent charm. It's not a great movie. I can't wholeheartedly recommend it. But I will say, if you like bad movies, there's something bad about this one that is watchable. Right. Uh, yeah, so that's everything I have to say about Grave of the Vampire from 1972. The film is 51 years old. You can find it streaming in a number of places, including on YouTube. Um, but don't settle for a bad version of it because it is in public domain. Someone out there will have a good version of it. So find it on Amazon <laughs> Prime or somewhere else. You don't have to All watch right. a terrible version. I'm going to have to watch it now if it's on public yes. domain. Yeah. So join us next week uh, as we cover a Stephen King adaptation, one that I just finally got on 4K, and we're going to talk about a film that has two vastly different cuts we're going to talk about needful things. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.